Welcome back to the latest edition of the Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net. I am James Sabalski. He is the Calder Trophy winner, Andrew Raycroft, and he is the Cup winner, Mike Commodore. And Kami, I feel like this is becoming a recurring theme every time we open up this show. But for those of you watching on YouTube, you can see it. For those of you on Spotify, at some point, you've got to see just how glorious Kami's flow is. But I, I blink and your hair grows, man. You're halfway back to the Afro. We've talked about growing it out again. Oh, got it. Like, this is like the peanut butter solution for somebody who's old enough to get that reference. But this is magic. Like, are you on PEDs <laughs> for hair? I got a lot of issues in life. The one issue I don't have is growing hair. By the time I go bald, it won't matter. Uh, but yeah, you know what? It's actually not even that gray. I just got a little gray around my ears. I know. It's impressive. Yeah. It is impressive, everybody. It's it's Thanks, solid. Guys. Yeah, I like it. Thank you. I like it. Got yeah. it. I, I'm, got just, it. I, I'm, I'm so <laughs> jealous how like you don't have a stitch of gray, man. I, I'm I'm like looking at pictures for myself for the past weekend, and I'm going, holy crap, that escalated quickly on my end. Where I'm. <laughs> You know, the highlights. The yeah, highlights. Yeah, it looked like somebody poured a bucket Run of flour on my head or something like that. Tommy, just <laughs> yeah, gorgeous. That's the key. That is the key. It I is no stress. stress. I got no oh, kids. No, no low stress around here. <laughs> <laughs> winner, winner, chicken dinner. There it is. He's, he's on Hakuna Matata <laughs> lifestyle, man. No worries. Um, <laughs> hey, we got a fantastic show coming up. Uh, lots of stuff to get to, including. Two-time Stanley Cup winner Alex Kalorn is going to join us. And, man, he, talk about one of the big offseason stories. Big time signing for the Ducks. He got himself paid after a spectacular run with the Lightning. Uh, fascinated to get his sense and how he's feeling. And uh, from one warm climate to another. But this was one of the big offseason signings for a lot of people who didn't get paid, Razor. You talked about this in the last episode. Like, where was the money? Alex Kalorn found the money. He sure did find the money, and he found a nice, warm, sunny <laughs> locale, just like Tampa. He is not a he is not a cold weather guy, and uh, it, it listen. It's a culture move, as just as much as anything. Andre Palat, we saw him go to New Jersey and yeah. and and make them better. Uh, the the Tampa Bay Lightning tentacles are are going to be all around the league by the end of uh, the next. This dynasty is over in Tampa. Guys will be everywhere else helping teams with the same knowledge that same veteran presence of, and the NHL just loves winners, right? At the end of the day, they love winners. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and this is what we're seeing the, the trickle down effect. And, you know, it's the whole copycat league uh, syndrome as well, right? Where everybody's trying to keep up with the Joneses and Hey, we want those elements to, you know, with the winning. And, you know, we saw that, and the, you know, you look in the last 10 years, you know, the trickle down effect that happened with the Chicago Blackhawks it forced them to have to retool. Look, the lightning still have a ton of talent. But fascinated to talk to uh, to talk to Alex Kalorn about his journey and to get to this point because it's a remarkable and a Harvard grad too, like no big deal, just an Ivy League well, school, just kind of drop a Harvard grad. Kami, the, got- they, those paychecks that he's getting pale in comparison to all of his roommates, to all of his classmates over at the, that institute. So the, the, you know, as as much as he's making a lot of money you know he's getting looked down upon by his graduating <laughs> class that have all started tech companies around the world. <laughs> all right, not everybody's Zuckerberg, I'm thinking, that graduates from Harvard. But, hey, Kami, you, you, tell us about Alice Kalorn from your standpoint. Before he joins us, uh, you guys have a past together, and you guys are, are pretty good friends. What can you tell us about Alex? Yeah, you know what? I actually don't know Killer, like, super great. Uh, we actually have, we have a bunch of mutual friends. Played against him a little bit when his career was starting. Um, and actually really my only experience with him was, uh, him and I went on a golf trip together about well, too long ago now, probably seven or eight years ago, but good dude. Like you guys were saying, Harvard grad, he's had a hell of a career, he's filling his pockets in Anaheim. Uh, so yeah, I'm interested to see what, uh, one, like you said, one coast to the other coast and kind of going from a veteran team to a young one. So I'm sure he's excited about that. Um, to see how that goes, but yeah, from all, he's a good dude. Yeah. Uh, so we'll get to Alex coming up in just a few minutes here on the Clearing the Crease podcast. But, hey, just a quick reminder, it's summertime, and that means the ice action at Bodog is hotter than ever. Yeah, the new season is just around the corner, so all you got to do is get in on some of that action and pick your cup winner for next season and do it now. Bodog.net has you covered with futures actions that will keep you in the game 
and in your game shape condition during the dog days of summer. In the meantime, Bodog also has you covered for all baseball action. You can find props, game lines, futures, make your home run pick, score big with Bodog. Check out the Ad Bodog CA Twitter page or X page, whatever they want to call it now. Just throw up a big X for details on how you can get up to $400 of free cash to play with now. And don't forget, everybody, we're also on all the Bodog social channels. Uh, you can find us on Spotify as well and YouTube. And be sure to tell a friend while you're at it as well. Remember, it's all the action, clearing the crease podcast from Bodog. Dot net. Uh, let's talk into some of the news that's been going on over the last little bit in the hockey world and uh, the end of an era. I mean, it's at some point, you know, the finish line is going to come, but it's still somewhat surprising when it does. And Andrew, your boy, man, after uh, a 20 year spectacular run in the National Hockey League, Patrice Bergeron kind of wakes up with the news for everybody uh, about a week ago that he is calling it a career after another solid campaign. I think there's a lot of people that would say, Hey, it's still some gas left in the tank here, but he calls it a career. Give me your reaction on this and, uh, and give me your feelings in terms of somebody that, you know, you know, closer than most people. Cause you guys were roommates at one time. Were you not? We were, we were, I was, uh, I was his first roommate in the national hockey league for a couple seasons. And when he was 18, 18 year old, far, I, I, I tried, I did try, but it, it was, he was impenetrable even at that age. And we did a lot of work here in Boston, a lot of interviews with Sean Thornton's and Milan Lucic's and Brad Marchand, of course, but the, 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 the overriding word was maturity. And that's what he was. Even as an 18 year old kid, his, his maturity level was off the charts. And, you know, I talk about, I was 23 at the time. And he was, he was way ahead of me and I'd been pro a couple of years. Um, and, and you see that carry through all the way his career and, and how he's acted in the professionalism. It's, it can't be overstated enough how great of a person this guy is. And I know everyone's talked about it. Everyone said those things, but I can't say it enough how much you'd want this guy to be your son, your daughter, your son-in-law, your brother, uh, just just a, a really proud person who worked really, really hard all through his career. Um, and so it, it's sad. It, for me, it, it, it basically really makes me feel old. Um, and, and, and I think just him going out on top, you know, as top as you can individually, right? It's, you, you never really win a cup and go off into the distance. Ray Bork left $10 million on the table. Like that, that just doesn't happen anymore. So, so for him to leave the way he did, he seemed at peace with it. And then just one, one thing coming across everything too, I guess, just to, to show everyone or, or talk to everyone about how good this guy was and how respected he was by everyone. 2007, 2008 misses the whole season because of a concussion, basically M plays 10 games next season. He scores eight goals. So the 08, 09 season, he scores eight goals. Team Canada chooses him for the 2010 Olympics coming off of a basically scored 30 goals in three seasons and team Canada and Sidney Crosby say, I want him on my line. The best player in the world at that time says, I want Patrice Bergeron on my line in the 2010 Olympics says the same thing in 2014 and the same thing in 2016. These guys were, um, I, I, it just very important to, to let everyone know. And for everyone to really think about how respected this guy was when the best player in the world wanted to play with him after he'd barely played in the NHL. You know, just to jump in on that quickly for me, my first real experience dealing with Patrice Bergeron was that 2005 world junior hockey championship during the lockout year, the lost season in the NHL. So you had all this talent that got kind of stuck in junior, you know, but you have 17 year old Sidney Crosby playing on a line with team Canada with Patrice Bergeron and Corey Perry, right? You talk about this mix and, and all three of those guys, you know, we'll see what, I, you know, we know, we know Sid's going to the hall. We know, but your Bergeron's going to the hall. And I think, you can make a pretty strong case for a guy who's a former Hart Trophy winner with Corey Perry to head to the stand, uh, to the Hall of Fame as well with the Stanley Cup in addition to gold medals. But that to watch that dominance and that line play together and, you know, it kind of parlays going for, further to what you just alluded to, you know, where Bergeron's still there in 2010 and a big piece of 2010. And on top of that, doubling down 
in Sochi in 2014. Now, you always talk about the stoic and, and, and just how, you know, mature. But is there a fun story about Bergeron that stands out for you at all? Or is he just too squeaky clean like Sid? Well, no, there's there's tons, you know, the Zamboni, we got to put the Zamboni commercial up. So it's pretty infamous here in Boston at this point. Uh, him, him and I did a commercial on a Zamboni in our first season, and it's basically allowed me to stay relevant here in Boston. Um, it comes on TV all the time. Anytime, the, you know, it was basically, it was all the time. So we're driving a Zamboni. It's, it's cheesy, cheesy acting. It's for, for Massachusetts license plates. So Hopefully, Bodoc can fire this up for us and, and get it out there. Hey, let's go. There's going to be a lot of traffic on the way to the game. Ah, uh, don't worry. I got Bruins play. People get out of the way. Au revoir. Have a good game. Great plates. I want them too. Are you even old enough to drive? But uh, the Zamboni commercial is one of the the favorites of of Patrice and I. He didn't go out like we don't. I don't have any going out stories. It, we did a lot of sleeping. We did a commercial together, and uh, <laughs> it, that that was the, the you know those are the the good stories of Patrice are are just how how funny he was to and basically didn't say a word his entire first season together. <laughs> Tommy, do you have any battles? Do you have any memories My of Bergeron? First. Yeah, you know what? Uh, I mean, obviously played against him quite a bit, but my yeah. first memory of him, I remember uh, 04, 05, some of the lockout season, mm -hmm. and I was playing in Lowell uh, for the Lock Monsters, and that was back in the, in the American League. I think we played our division like, I don't know, 12 times or something. Yeah. But my first memory of him was going into Providence, and I remember playing against, and American League was awesome. I mean, it's good every year, but it was really good that year. Um, and I remember playing against Providence, and I'm like, who is this guy? And, and, you know, playing on all, I'm like, this guy is Bergeron. This guy is a good player. And I remember him just lighting it up, but he was good in both ends. Um, I never met the guy, but I mean, I literally never heard even something remotely even mediocre about him. Um, I've heard he's a great dude, and yeah, I think we all agree that he's probably a first ballot Hall of Famer. I mean, he'd get my vote for sure. Um, and hell of a career for sure. But I haven't met him yet, I'd like to because he, he seems like he's everybody says he's a great dude. Yeah, uh, I mean, next stop, I'm in the ho hockey Hall of Fame. I, I, you know, I guess some people have made a case of do you rename the Selkie the Bergeron Award based on what he's done, and uh, you know, just, just simply spectacular. Uh, some other news that's happened over the last little bit. Uh, the Ottawa Senators making some news. It took a little while, but they finally move Alex to uh in, in the trade to Detroit, as everybody seemed to speculate. Just what, you know, the I think the package going the other way seemed a little uh, underwhelming in some respects. But then the Senators, uh, this move helps facilitate what had long been speculated this offseason, that Vladimir Tarasenko was going to be an Ottawa Senator. So more firepower for the Sens. They add a proven winner. As well, Vladimir Tarasenko isn't the Tarasenko from, say, five years ago. But how do you see this move playing out with the Sens? Razor, let's start with you here on this one. Uh, with the signing of Tarasenko, do you like it? And what do you make of it uh, in Ottawa? I like it. I don't know. It, it, I don't know if it, like, puts them over the top or if it's it's the move that they needed to make to, to yeah. get to the playoffs. But... Anytime you can add a talent like that for one season and take advantage of the landscape of this salary cap, I, yes, I like it. Um, does it keep pucks out of their net? Does it, does it solve the problems that they've had over the years with their terrible Octobers and Novembers that puts them so far behind and then they score a bunch of goals late in the season? I'm not sure, but the guy has won a cup. He's played in big markets. So now he's a big market guy going to Ottawa. So that, as you know, as much as anyone, Seaball, Ottawa loves that. They, they they always feel like the little brother. And when a big market guy comes to their place, they get excited about that. So it has to have the fan base excited as well. So it's a positive signing. I, I would have loved to, you know, have him on my team. Whatever team I was on, I'd want a goal scorer like that. How they fit him in, it'll be interesting. Uh, and 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 how excited and motivated he becomes is also another thing. But 
but yeah, all in all for Ottawa, you have to be excited for their signing. I'm not putting their names on the Stanley cup because of it, but, but you have to be happy that, that they get a good player coming to your lineup for cheap money. Yeah. To, to me, it still comes back to keeping pucks out of the net, right? That's been kind of the Achilles heel. And so I look more at the Corpus Salo move than anything, but sure. I mean, more firepower to a roster that probably didn't need more firepower, but you know, bringing in another winner for a team that's still, you know, that core is still really young, right? I mean, it's uh, you look at the moves that they have made and, you know, Sanderson, Stutzla, Norris, Batherson, Kachuk, uh, you know, it just the list goes on and on and on. Um, now you add a Tarasenko to a, that, that veteran voice with Claude Giroux, who was such a great fit last year. Um, the Sens are ready to take a step, right? They, they need to take a step. And I think probably management and coaching staff uh, recognize that, you know, butts are on the line here if they don't take that step forward. So, you know, I don't think there's any more excuses now. Sure, you can always try to improve here, there, and everywhere, but you've addressed goaltending. You've improved your back end. You've got the forward group now. Let's see where they go. Kami uh, Tarasenko, do you like it? Are you indifferent to it? Uh, what did you make of that one in Ottawa? Uh, I would say, like, I can't say I'm in love with him as a player, but he is. I mean, he scored 30-plus goals six or seven times, I think it is. I mean, there's no doubt the guy can score. Um, one year, if it was a multi-year deal for a ton of cash, I would have been like, I wouldn't be too sure about it, but one year, 5 million bucks. Uh, I don't mind it at all. I mean, I think I, if I was running the Sens, I, I probably would have bid on that too. So I, I'm with Razor, like I'm not engraving their names on the cup, but I don't, I don't mind the signing at all. Yeah, no, fair enough. Uh, it, to bring it to Detroit, uh, this was kind of speculated Michigan guy, um, you're a former Detroit Red Wing. Give me your sense of what Debrinket means to uh, to the Detroit Red Wings. Uh, there's a rebuild that I'm still kind of like, where is this team going? Like, it, he certainly helps and he makes the team better, but I'm still kind of like on the fence about Detroit long term here. They they have made some interesting. Moves. I like Debrinket. Uh, yeah. I do think he's a good player. I like the move. Um, I, I'm going to put my trust in Steve Eiserman. I mean, if I'm picking somebody to run a team, he'd be near the top of my list. So I'm going to believe in what he's doing. Some of the moves, maybe I'm not so sure about. Um, but yeah, no, I like to bring Ket, to bring him home. Uh, he's a good player. He wanted out of Ottawa. Uh, yeah, I mean, there are the Hall thing, good for Hall. We talked about this earlier. Um, but they think he's going to play better. Uh, but yeah, I'm I'm kind of on the fence, but I'll trust in Stevie Y. Yeah. Razor, what do you make of uh, of Detroit landing to bring it? I, I like this is a team that seemed to be pushing towards a playoff spot last year. And then kind of the bottom fell out in the back half. I, I just, I, I look at that core and their, their best players. And I, you know, I guess Larkin's kind of the anchor of that. And I just, I question like, is that group good enough just yet? You know, Sider's yeah. obviously promising Raymond. Yeah. You know, I, I do too. And, and, and similar to, and probably even less so than Tarasenko for me. Uh, I think I would rather have Tarasenko than to bring it. And that, that might be just from seeing the bring it in Chicago and Ottawa. Mm. I, when you have a smaller guy who scores a lot of goals on teams that aren't good, uh, it doesn't do much for me. It, it doesn't, you know, I, it just doesn't, it doesn't excite me when you have to pay a guy like that. Cause he scored 40 goals on a bad team in Chicago on a bad team in Ottawa garbage time it just it, it makes me nervous and how does that make detroit better how does that build culture in detroit by bringing a guy in who's never won anything there either so tarasenko going to ottawa he's won he's been in arenas that are full in march and april that that matter so i, I think that that's the bonus for Ottawa compared to Detroit. And it seems like those two teams along with Buffalo are the one that are trying to get rid of one of the teams that were in the playoffs last season. And I think Ottawa has done a better job and, and gotten themselves a little bit closer than Detroit has. Yeah, no, no, I, I that makes the logic. I, I think when you Good look take. at the age, yeah, the, 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 the age you'd kind of say, okay, well you take to bring it as a no brainer. Yeah. But when you spell it out like that, no, call me. I think you just said it. Good take. I, I, I it makes a whole lot of sense in terms of, you know, those guys. It's, you know, Reggie Jackson was known as Mr. October in Major League Baseball. Brian Savage, respectfully, was known as Mr. October in hockey circles. And you don't <laughs> want to be known as 
Mr. October is a guy who produces, <laughs> uh, puts up big numbers in October, Wrong but month. then, you know, kind of <laughs> throws up a lot of zeros when it matters in those meaningful games in, in March and April. So, yeah, let's see what DeBrink can do and if he can be a difference maker for that team. Um, one of the things I do wanted to hit on uh, as we kind of hit these dog days of summer, I want to go through for the next few weeks as we get closer to puck drop for the next 2023 2024 season kind of looking at teams in the off season where they sit right now as we go through and we'll go through division by division here over these next few episodes and it should time out nicely before by the time we get to puck drop for opening night but let's let's start with the metropolitan division and give me a sense here boys on how we feel about whether contender pretender are they elite are they just simply rebuild or are they the drizzling shits if for a lack of a better description <laughs> so uh let, let's start with the metropolitan we'll go in alphabetical order but let's go with carolina Kami, you want a cup with the canes carolina elite contender pretender fraud what are you saying I got Carolina. I made a little list here. You know, we had the little pre, the little rundown. I was doing yeah. a little research. We research. both did some research. Did we actually research. both did research, did research this research. time. That's new. That is new. <laughs> Pen and paper. I've got, I've got Carolina at the top of my list in the elite category. Wow. I got them high. I like the Canes. I like their moves. I love their head coach. I think they play hard. Uh, I'm putting, I mean, we're not going to go with the Kami Cup again this year. I'm sure we're going to pick somebody else, but I do really like the game. Elite for me. Elite. Razor? Yep. Carolina is my only elite team in the East. Everybody, I've got different slots for everyone else. Carolina is right there at the very top in the elite. Uh, their moves, their defense, even bringing D'Angelo back. He fit in. I mean, I know he, he's got his things, and it's another show, but – uh he fit he in really well there he fit in really well there they know okay. that and, and another guy that 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 they can get back there and so i i love what they've done i love orlov i really love orlov um so carolina's elite for me yeah i mean you know what if you look at that team on paper and it checks a lot of boxes and i'm a huge rod the bod fan as well but at some point they have to win a game in the eastern conference finals again, right <laughs> like at some point it has to just click and this is what i wonder and this is what i wonder respect are they trending like are they are they trending in that direction to be that team and i i i've got them a rung low i've got them in contender as a uh just outside the elite status and and i just think that like they've got, I love their back end. They've got a lot of depth up front, but I just think like, unless Svechnikov kind of takes it, you know, comes back full health. I, I just, I just feel like eh, there's just maybe a little offense that's missing there for that difference maker. Do you know what I mean? Razor? Like, no, I, I, just, I, I hear you. And I think I might be going the other way on it just because of their due. And it, maybe it's that simple for me. Yeah. They're due and, and that's not too scientific <laughs> and probably doesn't really work in real life. But I'm almost at that point where they, they they've added on the back end again. It's just, and they've been so close that Svechnikov, if he comes back and if he's healthy, like, can they get over the top? Um, it, it seems like a timing issue for me with the group that they have. That's all. Yeah, no, it's uh, I mean, maybe, maybe, you know, the lightning ultimately got swept by Columbus and then follow up, you know, the next couple of years with back-to-back -back Stanley Cups. So, okay, Carolina, uh, we go to Columbus. And Columbus, for me, guys, I put me down in the WTF category. And and part of me looks at it, look, you've got Mike Babcock. And, and so oh, I think from a coaching standpoint, I think they're going to be structurally better as a team. But my issue with the Jackets is I look at Patrick Laine and Johnny Goudreau respectfully speaking they seem like two of the flakiest players in the league and and provorov like that's your core right like and this is where i kind of wonder like are those the guys you're going that's going to take you to the promised land or how far are you going to go with two guys that just they seem to be very jekyll and hyde like so so what's the so basically i have these guys in the second to last tier they're not they're not the shittiest of the shitty uh i don't think anymore because of uh, you know 
Despite what we think of Babcock, I think that, you know, he he cracks the whip enough to get them seven or eight more points just to take them out of that shitty move. (laughs) And Lane, Merzlinkis can't be that bad again. Uh, The other Russian kid that they have there can't be that bad. So I think they can't have that many injuries. I think it's just a a product of them getting out of the very bottom tier for me. They're in that second to last tier with a couple other teams from the Metro division. Tommy, Columbus. My blue jacket. Um, I'm going to put them. I mean, I hate to say this. I would love to just toss them in the shit category. I mean, I would love to fire Babs in the shit category. But if I'm being honest, they're going to be better. I'm going to be, I'm re- I don't really like that line as a player. I've never really liked them. It's going to be interesting to, interesting to see, in my opinion, how he gets along with Babs. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think they're going to be better. That Fantilli seems like a good player. Um, but yeah, I guess I, I'm going to put them just above shit. So I guess I'll, I'll go with the unsure category if we're going on not elite, not contenders, rebuild-ish to unsure. Let's jump. Uh, let's jump over to the Devils now. Uh, Kami, we'll start with you on this one. Uh, the New Jersey Devils. <laughs> the Devils, my boys, the Devils. Uh, I got them as contenders. I like the Devils. I don't think they're elite. Um, I'm not. I like. I mean, Toffoli going over there. I mean, I've seen Toffoli play quite a bit recently. Come from Calgary. I like. I know he's a little bit older, but he can play. I mean, he's I like a big time him. player. Yeah. I mean, he played well in Calgary last year. I know Calgary wasn't great, but. I'm going to put I put New Jersey as like solid contenders. I could see them winning a couple rounds next year for sure. Razor? I've got them in tier three. So just three. below, Ooh. I've got them in the third tier. Uh, it, again, the East, I didn't – most of my my top teams are on the other side. So I have uh, I have New Jersey as number three, the, solidly in the playoffs. I feel like Magic was with them last season. They'll, they might be a little bit tougher. I think they're goaltending. You know, Ken Vanacek, Ken Schmid coming into the NHL. I just feel like they might go struggle just a little bit more as they've tinkered with it, but they'll be there in the in, in the playoffs come come April. I to me, I look at I've got them in contender status. Uh, goaltending still makes me a little unsure in terms of what they're going to do, but this wave of New Jersey hockey just might make us forget what we hated about '90s hockey, right? That yes. devil's <laughs> dynasty to just clutch it up. and grab and lock that shit up, right? And, mm-hmm. um, you know, they are high octane. They are fun. They're plucky. Um, you know, they ran rough shot over the Rangers uh, in the playoffs. I, I think, you know, let's see where goaltending can take them. But uh, I've got them in contender status. Not elite, but contender status. Uh, which leads us to the New York Islanders. So we'll stay in the Tri-States area. The Islanders. I can I, I to me, I've got them in the unsure because I like them as a hardworking team. They've got goaltending, but I come back to goal scoring, and I just don't know if they're top-end guys like Barzell, great skater, playmaker, but from an offense standpoint, I don't know if I trust Anders Lee and Bo Horvat and Barzell to be the guys to to carry that load um, You know, in, in an Eastern Conference that has a lot of firepower. I've got them in tier three with the New Jersey Devils. Mm-hmm. I bumped them up. I I I don't know why. I don't know why. But it it's Lou, those deals, getting Sorokin. I think they grind it out a little bit better than they did last season. I think they get a bit of a bump with the Horvat being there all year. They get the power play going a little bit earlier in the season. Mayfield, we talked about him. I like that deal with keeping those guys. So I think they had an off season last year, and I think they bump up a little bit further up. Not contender, not elite, but but that rung of uh, their playoff team. I got them in category three, too. I'm a little unsure. I mean. To me, I mean, I don't, it's not like I see a lot of Islanders hockey, but to me, it seems like everybody's on like an eight year deal there. Um, I'm not <laughs> sure about some of the, I'm like, man, everybody's getting paid in New York. It's great. <laughs> Good for those guys. I'm going to put them as unsure. They're not shit. They can defend all right, um, but I don't think they're content. They're kind of no, old, aren't they? Wouldn't you say? A little bit? That's, yeah. No, no. I think they're a little old. There's, there's an eight. Everybody's on eight year deal. <laughs> good for those guys but good uh, time to be an islander yeah, you, <laughs> yeah. Hey. Oh, certainty 
By the way, as we're rattling Thanks, through the, the the Metropolitan, I was thinking, man, we need to rename this division the the, the Metro Commodore, right? Like Carolina, Columbus, New Jersey. Just start rattling <laughs> off all the all the, all the uh, passport stops there for Mike. Uh, okay, we go to the Rangers. We stay in New York. To, uh, where do we want to start with the Rangers? I, I just we don't have a phony stat uh, department, do we? Because that's where I, you know, Kami, you suggested it last year, but I, I game of trust. I don't trust the Rangers. I don't trust the Rangers. You know, you're, the turnstile with coaches year after year after, you know, this third coach since 2021 with Quinn Gallant. Now you're trying Laviolette. Um, I don't know. I, I just don't know if I trust this core to to go the distance. I'm I'm unsure on the Rangers. They're, they're yeah. firmly am I unsure. I like Laviolette. I mean, obviously I'm biased. I've played for Lavi and we had some success together. I like Peter. He's a good guy and I think he's a good coach. Uh, but yeah, I'm not sure. Things didn't really work out last year. There, a couple of you know they tried the the Tarasenko and the Kane and, and tried to. I'm I I don't trust them. I think I'd say I like the Rangers pretty much exactly the same as the Islanders for me. So I'm do I. Unsure. But I'm more positive about them. I, I'm I've got all three oh. New York City teams in the same tier three with a couple other Atlantic Division teams. I think the Rangers are. A playoff type group. I think Laviolette is a good bump going into this season. Like you said, Kami, I think he's a good one year coach, two year coach where he'll get the best. Shesterkin's one of the best in the league. Um, certainly not contenders, could be pretenders, could be pretenders, but I am more bullish yeah. on, on those two teams, the three teams in the in the metro New York area than you guys are at this point. So I'll get a little negative here with the next few, I'm sure, than you guys. <laughs> okay, well, let's go. Okay, so we go to we go to Pennsylvania, and uh, we go to the Penguins. Uh, I love – man, I have been betting on Sid for years, but for the last, uh, what, six, seven years now, it has not worked for me, and I, I just don't know where I see that finish line, and I wonder, even in the, the idea of Eric Carlson there, um, can you catch lightning in a bottle? I mean, it'd be fun to watch. But I just I've got them in that sort of unsure category. I, I if they get Carlson, I reserve the right to change my my Fair. my prediction, my Fair. thoughts. But I think they're dropping. I, I don't. They were close to the playoffs last season. They're right there with the Islanders. I don't see that happening. I, I think they take a big drop off, despite having Sid and Malkin. And it kind of hurts me to say that because you just believe in those guys so much. I hate what they did in goal going back to Jari for five. I, so I'm uh, I'm way down. I I put Pitt in the same kind of tier as as Columbus in that fifth tier, below uh, below a few of the upstart teams in the East. Afro man, what do you say? Uh, I don't have them quite as far down and as Razor does, but I am kind of on that program. I don't like. I mean, I never hate, hate betting against Sidney Crosby. I mean, obviously yeah. the incredible player for a long time, but. I don't know. I mean, sooner or later, it's been a long time. Malkin, look, Malkin's a great player, but, you know, I watched a couple, and every once in a while, Malkin can bail it in a little bit. So I'm going to put them as, I don't have them like not shit, but I, I would say I'm very, very unsure. As much as Penguin fans will hate to hear this, I think I think the party with that core is almost over. Um, so I think they're definitely trending down, would be my guess. Yeah, and I hate work. to say that. I hate to say that too. I don't like saying that about Sid. He's awesome. But no, I, I agreed. I, I'm a big. Uh, I'm Team Sid as well. But Kyle Dubas mm -hmm. has a lot of work ahead of him in uh, in Pittsburgh. But he got the Islanders contract as well. So <laughs> good for him. Go. Uh, <laughs> all right, uh, Philly. I think we're universally. They are in rebuild mode. Or uh, I mean, yeah. I, I like Danny Briere. I like rebuild. Alan, probably the management team that they brought. But I mean, I think it's fair to say that rebuild and there's going to be it's going to be a long year. Yeah, tier five Long for me, year. just above, you know, right, right in that shit mode. Yeah. Similar to Columbus, maybe get a bump with Carter Hart, but they're 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 nowhere near where they they need to be. It's a while. Capitals, you know, if they're healthy, maybe it's a different story. But I kind of see the way you kind of outline the Penguins crumbling. I know, me too. I, I've had them right beside each other. I see the same thing happening. Uh, and and again, it's a, you don't you want to see Ovi, you want to see Sid go at each other. There's no no bigger fan of Ovi than myself. I, I want him to get a thousand goals, but I I think 
new coach doesn't give the same bump that that Lavi does in New York, for instance. I just see them down in that fifth tier as well. With Pitt, with Columbus, with Washington, those guys will beat their brains out for 15th in the division or in the conference. I'm on that program too. I think, uh, like I said, uh, Ovechkin, I did the same kind of thing as Pittsburgh. For me, hell of a career. I think this is going to, the next year or two is going to kind of turn into uh, you know, goal scoring for Ovi, and let's get this guy goals. I, I'm not high on Washington at all, fifth tier. Whatever the bottom tier is, that's where I'll pull Washington. Yeah, no, I think we're all on the same page on that one. All right, there is the Metropolitan Division here on the Clearing the Crease podcast, powered by Bodog. The Clearing the Crease podcast continues, powered by Bodog.net, Sabalski, Raycroft, Commodore, and we are joined by two-time Stanley Cup champion and the man who may have won the summer this offseason in the National Hockey League. Uh, you know, they say don't judge a book by its cover, but how about this guy? Alex Kalorn, Harvard graduate, man. I'm looking at, you know, it's like... <laughs> You know, you have the beer, the trucker hat, and just kind of chilling. <laughs> Harvard grad, man. Like, that is a boss play right there. Well done. Thank you. I mean, don't let anyone in nowadays, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> No, it's good. Yeah, I was I was lucky enough to go there. My mom kind of pushed me to go to Harvard. I mean, I feel like every time I do a podcast or whatever, I kind of have to explain it because it's such a unique situation that I went but Your there. mom was a teacher, right, Alex? Yeah, she was a teacher, so she was – you know, till this day, she's more proud that I went to Harvard than that I won two Stanley Cups. Honestly, she couldn't she cares about both, but for her, that was more important. So I'm happy she she led me that way, though. It it, uh, it was good. Yeah, that you should be proud of that. I I tell yeah. that to my kids too. We're I'm here in Boston, Killer, as you know, and and I tell them if you know, it always surprises me that these college guys that and I talk to Teddy Donato. Uh, all the time he's like i'm fighting guys to to come here instead of going to maine or or boston college and i not to take anything away from those programs but it always amazes me that there aren't enough moms and dads like yourselves that like that, that pushes that angle because it is a special place and, and something that uh it, you, you can be proud to do and say and talk about for the rest of your life for sure and that was one of the, the reasons i mean i wasn't a huge prospect coming um, out of high school and you know even the high prospects nowadays you never know when you get drafted if you're going to be a player if you're going to have a full career and I think I kind of always had that in the back of my mind if things don't work out but um, yeah I don't know how you'd pick Maine over over Boston to be honest <laughs> yeah. there is a finance there's the only problem with the Ivy Leagues which yeah. is they have they don't give scholarships so that's why a lot of the good players will tend to go to BC or BU because if your parents have any type of money, like they have to pay, there's no way to get out of it. So that's just the downfall of going to the Ivy league schools. How did you navigate that? Like, just in terms of, you know, the course load, obviously you hear about from, from an academic standpoint, when you talk about schools with academic reputations, I mean, you take a look at a power rankings, Harvard's probably, you know, right near the top, if not at the top. Uh, how did you find that being the student athlete at that time? Because I would think yeah. it's probably a little different than some of the other schools that we talk about being having great athletic programs. It, it was different for sure. I mean, they say the hardest part about Harvard is getting in. I will say well, it is hard. It's easier for a hockey player. But um, once you get in, it's still pretty hard. You like, you know, the course load's really tough. And most kids that are there are just completely focused on school. Whereas yeah, being a hockey player, you got to play two games a week. You got to practice. Um, I guess the good part is we had older guys that helped us navigate certain classes. You know, you're not taking the math, you know, the, you know, the math courses that are, you know, for some of the most intelligent people in the world, you're kind of just figuring out what works for you. But some kids, you know, they want to take those classes. They went to Harvard. They're smart kids, but um, you know, like writing a 25 page paper before a game, like probably nothing, probably something that you know, Tommy didn't do at North Dakota. Like it's just different. <laughs> I hear you. I, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't. That wasn't a shot. Yeah. <laughs> no, I agree with the killer. Oh, I'm, not, I'm, I'm commenting. <laughs> yeah. What did you okay. take in school, killer? So at first I was going to do a degree in economics and then kind of figured, you know, I went to government, which was just made more sense for me. You know, it was a, in government. If you wrote a bad paper, you got a B minus. If you did bad in economics, you could actually fail. So 
Um, that's kind of the way for me, it made more sense. And I enjoyed it a little bit better. That's survival. That's survival. Uh, uh, yeah. Let's talk about the off season move, uh, going to Anaheim and, and, uh, the end of an era in Tampa, obviously what a legacy to leave behind. How hard was it? Um, yeah. what's the, what all factors into, to that sort of moment? Um, uh, because yeah. you've obviously spent a decade with Tampa and with tremendous success and guys that I'm sure you probably call your brother here for the next, uh, sure. for the rest of your life. Yeah. I mean, to be, it, it's one of the toughest decisions I've ever had to make. And I say that, you know, obviously I had a great situation that I'm stepping into, but um, you know, Tampa's the only team I've played with. Coop's been my, really my only coach my whole career. So, you know, change at first was, was scary. And I kind of tried to do everything in my power to stay just because it was comfortable. And that's kind of would have been the easy way out. And I did have a chance to stay. I mean, the contract didn't make much sense, but you know, my heart was so involved with Tampa that I, I kind of was trying to make it make sense in my head. Mm -hmm. And, you know, over a week, I just kept saying, you know, this is going to be fine. And after talking to a bunch of people, it, it just, um, uh, it didn't make sense. And, um, it, it's tough to leave, but, like I said, I got a great deal with Anaheim and I look forward to, it's going to be a different situation for me. I've been on a team where, you know, we've done a lot of winning and we've had a lot of like veteran leadership and um, it's going to be a lot different going there and kind of helping this rebuild and kind of being maybe a veteran presence in the locker room and helping some of these younger guys uh, hopefully become, you know, a winning team within these next couple of years. That, that's exactly where I wanted to go is, is just your mindset going there after being an important leadership part of the Tampa Bay lightning, but, it, but from, from afar, from where I'm sitting, I'm looking at Anaheim and thinking you're the guy and you're the culture guy. Now you're the, you're coming in, you're changing everything. That's your responsibility. Have you thought about how that's going to work for you very much in the off season, or are you just going in and being yourself? Well, I think I'm going to be myself. Uh, you know, I, I did have that leadership role in Tampa. You know, I wore an A, but it's a lot different. We had Stammer. We had, you know, I always say that I, I've played under such great leaders. I mean, looking back to like Marty St. Louis, Le Cavalier, uh, Ryan McDonough, uh, Ryan Callahan, you know, Steven Stampos, Victor Hedman, all guys that are great leaders. And I was definitely a part of that leadership. I think a big reason why Anaheim made this push to sign me was to kind of, I don't know, you said be the guy. I think I'll be one of the guys over there, but they definitely need that kind of influence uh, in the locker room and kind of build a culture over there. I know they're, they're like pipeline and their prospects. I don't know. I don't know anything about them, but everyone says they're supposed to be really good. So um hoping to just help out, you know, I really, and keep playing, keep playing well. Taylor, I want to talk to you. I'm going to go a little sideways here. I want to hear about this golf tournament you played in a couple of weeks ago. A, how good of a time did you have? And B, what did you learn about your golf game? Because I got a little, I did get a little info from your caddy. Yeah. You, said <laughs> you striped it, striped it day one, and then things got a little harder. So how yeah. was that experience? And congrats on getting into that too. That yeah, how'd you get in on that too? I'll, I'll piggyback. That's, that's smart. That's, you're a big deal if you're in that. Yeah, you're the well, top of the top. Oh. Oh. So I will say I'll lead by explaining how I got in. So four years ago, NBC was filming this curling thing and it never aired. Um, it was in Raleigh, North Carolina, and they couldn't find anyone to play in this curling tournament. It was going to play in between games. So in the playoffs, if they had some spare time, they were just going to show the footage of it was a curling tournament. Every team had an NHL player, a women's player, and then two Olympian um, curlers. So there was a bunch of teams and we battled it out, but um, I told them, they asked me to do it. And I said, I got to fly to rally in the middle of the summer. Like if you, you know, if you let me play in the Tahoe, I'll come. So they said, you know, <laughs> they said, if you nice. come and film the thing for three days, um, we'll let you play in the Tahoe. So the problem was Jeremy Roenick was very involved in the filming and he was in a lot of the, the, the tournament because he was on a team. And then they had a falling out, NBC and Jeremy Roenick. So they didn't, they never ended up airing it, but they held up their end of the bargain. We went to the cup, you know, three years in a row. So I wasn't able to go. And then this summer, I just kind of messaged them and they said, you come. Yeah, you're welcome to come. Well, that's played. Wow. I, yeah, to kind of, you know, 
it was one of the coolest events I've ever been to in my life. You know, Tommy, I mean, there's the amount of celebrities that were at this tournament. Obviously, being a hockey guy, you're kind of, I don't want to call you a pigeon, but like, you know, there's some of the biggest actors. <laughs> you know, you got Aaron Rodgers, Miles Teller, all these guys. And once you're in the tournament and you're part of it, they like really take you in. I remember like I went to the tee box and Vince Carter was teeing off. And, you know, growing up in Canada, Vince Carter was like, one of my all-time idols and he just came up shook my hand like hugged me because he saw i was playing so everyone has a lot of time cool. there um and vince I lives in Te he lives in florida now uh, does he not i think in the office yeah, that was the first time I, Denver, I, I, yeah. I don't know yeah i think he lives there but it the golf itself was was stressful for sure i mean day one <laughs> i mean you know how it is like even playing i've never played tournament golf so I played it in like member guests where there's a little bit of pressure, you know, club championships where there's a little bit of pressure. But, you know, what happened was I played really well the first day and, and Colt, I'm sure, told you. I was like one under and I didn't, uh -huh. make, I didn't make any putts. So I was just hitting the ball so good. So I was like, dude, Colt, if we figure out this putting, like I might have a chance. And then <laughs> I'm, tied, I'm in third place and they reseed you. The first day I was playing with Oshi. And this girl, Hallie Ledbetter. And there was no pressure. Osh was Osh is the best guy ever. He was kind of walking me through it. And uh, when I made a birdie, he was like jumping all over me and just kind of calming me down. And the next day I got reseated. So I'm playing with Steph Curry and Pavelski. Wow. And Feature uh, group. You know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know when they talk about like golfers getting to play with Tiger Woods? And having like so many people watching, it, it kind of felt like that. I just wasn't ready for the moment. Like I, I wasn't. And uh, I didn't. I play. I didn't play great, but um, playing with Steph Curry was cool. He had the hole in one. He has, He actually hit. The, he. I mean, I was playing so bad. I was hitting third or groups of three. I was hitting third all day. I was just last guy. I was in the tee. Um, but he hit the hole in one. He was second guy. We we all ran up to the to the green. We're celebrating. And then Colt's like, dude, you gotta, you gotta still hit your shot. <laughs> <laughs> I was playing, I wasn't playing great. And then all the fans are going crazy. I'm like walking back to the tee box. <laughs> Curry's Curry ended up doing an interview just left of the tee box, right in front. And uh, I'm like, I can't hit. I'm not playing well. What if I like snap hook one into Curry's head while he's doing his interview with the whole one? <laughs> and Colt, Colt, you know, Colt, Colt's like, dude, you just got to hit, just do it. I ended up hitting like one of my best shots just because no one was watching me, right? Everyone was doing <laughs> it. But uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was great to play with though. Such a, such a good guy. What an experience. How I, good is that swag bag? The swag bag's nice. Everything's nice. I mean, it's just the people you meet, man. Like Miles Teller actually grew up in the same town as my girlfriend in the middle of nowhere, Florida. So he, he loved that. Um, you know, just a ton of guys. And everyone's good. They're good people. Um, there was like a karaoke night where all like the, you know, the celebrities that were singing. And it, it was pretty fun. It was just a good, it was a good event. But I will say like my first time playing, I learned a lot about my game. Like, you know, I, hope <laughs> so bad. I mean, my hands like were shaking over putts. I had a tough time getting the putter back a couple of times, but I hit it good. <laughs> I to figure that part out. I, I don't know if you guys have played on, Poana greens but that first day was the first time i played the course and i was like they're rolling i swear to you like 13 and uh Oof. i just couldn't figure out the greens but yeah it was a good experience yeah i'm sure Cole was talking all sorts of shit about me <laughs> <laughs> he carved you a little bit he did talk you up though he said day one you were unreal i will amazing. say Colt, and Colt was a decent caddy um the best thing about Colt was he knows everyone in the tournament. So like yeah. networking wise, I got to meet a ton of people just because Colt was on my bag. He knows so many people. It was, it was great in that sense. And we did have some fun throughout the tournament. I don't know if that helped me uh, help the nerves throughout the tournament. I thought it was going <laughs> to that's kind of why we did it, but it kind of worked the other <laughs> way around, but it was a great experience. I, I hope to go back. Yeah. Killer, you're, you're, right. you talk about like, these sorts of moments and these experiences in terms of having a per like you're one of the guys I think in the hockey world that is not afraid to share your personality Yeah. at a time where there's still 
I, you know, I think we're starting to see that. I think the league is trying to embrace that more to kind of show off, you know, individual personalities. You know, you've got a great social media following. You kind of put yourself out there, you know, doc talk with killer and, um, you know, you, you seem to embrace it at a time where there's still a lot of guys that are kind of that old stay in your lane, keep your head down. It's all about the team. Um, what sort of, I, I guess, where, why do you take that approach for one? And I guess part B to that is what sort of advice would you say to, you know, to younger athletes who are kind of on that fence going, well, I would like to do something, but I worry that, you know, my coach going to give me shit or, or something along those lines. What would you say to them? Uh, So what I would say is that the leagues changed so much. I remember, and I know every guy says that. And when I got in the league and Instagram started, I, I don't know if it was this way with comedy, but if someone posted a picture, like the veterans in the, in the room were like, would be on you. Like, why are you posting a picture on social media? What are you doing? So I think a lot of guys shied away because of that. They didn't want to catch flack from some of the older guys on the team. And then at a certain point, you get older and you're like, maybe let's try to grow this game. You know, we're kind of falling behind in a lot of, in a lot of ways with the NFL and the NBA, it seems like the NBA, all they want to do is promote themselves. Whereas hockey guys, we kind of think it's selfish to do that. But once you become confident in yourself and you know, you're not like a selfish guy, you just, you're trying to promote the game. You're trying to promote yourself. It's, it's good for while you're playing and it's good for after you're playing um, stuff like Tahoe. I kind of get in the mix because you do these kind of things and it just creates a lot of opportunities and helps grow the game. I would say, if you have, not everyone has that personality. We have guys in our team that it's just not for them. They don't like to do that and that's fine. But if you do have that personality, you're helping the game, you're helping yourself. And I wouldn't shy away from it at all. Love it. Be remiss to not ask more about the Tampa Bay Lightning and, and the Stanley Cups that you won there. Beyond the guys, beyond the Cups, beyond just being a, a massive part of, of a dynasty, from my point of view, as a former NHL, you guys were, were our dynasty and you're a massive part of that. What are you going to miss the most about Tampa just in general? Probably going to miss the hot stove. And I don't know if many people know. I mean, we have, like, <laughs> we had a great little room in the back where our equipment guys, it was an equipment manager's room, but they gave it to us after the games. And we just go in there and have a couple of beers and, Talk about if things weren't going well, we kind of tried to hash things out. Things were going great. We just have fun. But that's kind of what I'm going to miss. I mean, you make so many great friendships, especially when you win championships. Like you feel like you've built a brother for life. And a lot of these guys, you know, are, are brothers to me. So it's going to be tough leaving them. The organization has been so good to me. This is kind of Tampa is my home. I'm still in Tampa right now. So it's going to be hard to leave. But in the end, you have to be grateful for for the memories you made and how how good things were, um, and that you were lucky enough to play with one team for eleven years. I mean, that doesn't happen a ton, especially a guy in my shoes who is I'm not a superstar by any means. So to to play for one team as long as I have, I I, I have a lot of gratitude for that. That's awesome. No, in terms of the experience, and you know, just kind of winding it down. Um, 2015 Stanley Cup Final. Tampa, Chicago. One of the yeah. craziest, incredible goals I've ever seen. The no look backhand past Corey Crawford. <laughs> if you were given a hundred more, like how much do, have you practiced that? <laughs> and if you were given a, a thousand opportunities, could you, how many times could you recreate that moment? Like that is, that is an all time. It's too bad you don't win that year because that goal kind of gets forgotten about to a degree. Like, but if you guys win the cup that year, we probably talk about that being one of the most iconic goals ever. Yeah. That's uh <laughs> there's a picture of that, like in the locker room when you, when you walk by that, that goal, you know, I was, it was a moment where I was playing like some of the best hockey of my life. I was just, you know, when you're just feeling good and everything was going my way. And like you said, if I had a thousand times, I'd probably be able to hit the puck a couple of times, but <laughs> to put it in between his like skate and the, the the post was i don't know if i'd be able to recreate that a thousand times so i insane yeah. dude that was so crazy was like nice. that's not a redirect like that puck is going through and you bat it with a backhander 
Like that yeah. was sick. Like I watched it again this morning just to I want to see this one more time because I want to ask it like crazy. Yeah. Well done. I don't, I don't want that one over again. Put it that way. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, listen, Alex, thanks so much for doing this. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, what, a, what a summer it's been for you. What a tremendous career. And as you said, you know, a guy who, who takes an unconventional path to, to get to the National Hockey League, but Harvard grad, uh, you know, you, you win in the American League, you pay your dues a decade with Tampa, two Stanley Cups later, and, you know, you deserve every cent you've just got here, man. And, uh, and keep that personality going. I think the league needs more players like you, so – Keep embracing it and go easy on Steph Curry next time you're hitting a ball in the air. Right? <laughs> Thanks for having me, guys. That was fun. Thanks, Keller. All right, thanks, Thank guys. you. Thanks, Alice Todd. Kalorn joining us here on the Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net. The Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net continues. Sabalski, Kami, Razor, ready to bring this thing home. Uh, you know, killer. I mean, uh, Alice Kalor, what a, what a story, what a journey. And, uh, you know, it's hard not to root for those guys, uh, in terms of what he's done. And again, like <laughs> people can question the, the cap and the, whatever you want. He deserves it, man. That guy worked his ass off to get what he got there. Razor. He sure does. And he's going to turn into, you yeah. know, obviously we, we, do, we actually do do a little homework here. He's going to turn into a 1200 game national hockey league guy. Wow. He's going to turn into a 600 point national hockey league guy. It's it, he, and I mean, 140 playoff games too. So to, to be a part of yeah. that is, and he talked about just how special it is to be part of that group, but, but to contribute the way he did is, uh, is impressive and probably overlooked and, and now won't be as overlooked as he goes to Anaheim and, and leads that group through his thousand games. And, and Kami, the perks that come with it too, right? With winning, I mean, playing the Tahoe yeah, perks that come with it too, right? With winning, I mean, playing the Tahoe. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting in the big events, feature groups. I mean, I think it'd be pretty fair to say that at the end of the day, Alex is one of the, one of the better Tampa Bay Lightning players ever. I mean, yep. you got to put him in the conversation. The long time there, delivered what it counts. So he's, he's had a hell of a career. It's the guys that you immediately think of when you think of this Tampa Bay Lightning era, right? You think of Stamkos, you think of Vasilevsky, you think of Hedman, Kucherov, you think of, you know, Braden Point. Um, but Alex Kalorn, man, was right there through it all and, mm -hmm. and getting there with when, helping change that culture, right? And there for those Stanley Cup appearances in 2015. And you look at the numbers, like that guy's a playoff performer too, right guys? Like that's a guy who shows up. Well, and you made a point and, and he did as well a little bit in that to, to be able to be there for 11 years, play 800 games and not be the superstar, not be the yeah. first overall pick or the first round pick goes to how important he actually was. I always look at those guys that, that play in one place or stay in one area and, and they, they, but they're not the superstars that actually goes to how important they are. And is, is quite telling in, in what that group thought of thought of Alec and thinks of Alex actually. Yeah. A hundred percent. No, congratulations. I really appreciate him joining the show here today. That was fun. Um, all right. As we wind things down, uh, don't forget, Hey, reply to this video, wherever you're watching, you can shoot a DM to at Bodog CA as well on Twitter or the Bodog YouTube or Instagram page with a question for Kami razor, myself and if we pick your question you get yourself a free nhl jersey courtesy of your friends and ours at boat dog so this week's winner is aubrey from moncton who says will the nhl ever expand to a new city in canada that has never had a team i think there's some smaller markets out there who would love to have a team what city do you think has a prayer thanks for having the best hockey podcast on youtube so well thank you very much aubrey and the answer Guys, I'll, I'll, I'll kick this one off. I, I think if Not there was like another answer. Canadian city, no. and yeah, I mean, if you want to just go hard, no, I'll throw a pie in the sky. I'll say Hamilton. Hamilton, um, you know, 30 years ago, they came up short uh, when the NHL opted to go with Ottawa and Tampa. And obviously, Jim Balsillie, when Blackberry was going through its big run in the mid 2000s, Razor, you remember that, right? Oh, the, yeah. Hold, of tried course. to hold the. Basically tried to move the Predators up to, uh, or was no, it was the Penguins. No, it was Pittsburgh. It was, it was Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. You tried Penguins, to, uh, you know. Yeah, tried to move them up to uh, to Hamilton. 
So there was that sort of possibility, but I, I, I just look at market size. I just don't see how the dollars could work for a, a, any city smaller than that and whether they would consider a, another team in the GTA. Um, that's the only one I could really see, guys. Yeah, and, and, and I know you're stretching on that too because Buffalo is going to put mm-hmm. up a fight. Toronto is yeah. putting up a fight that, that draws from all of those teams and, and that they just won't allow it. It, it's, it stinks because... Everyone knows the passion in Canada and it would be supported, et cetera, et cetera, but it's not going there. And we've seen that it's pretty evident that the dollar is a big problem. Uh, taxes are a big problem and, and the league just can't afford to have eight teams up there. They, they need to be more recognizable down here in the United States. And they're going to find the United States markets like Houston and Atlanta again, way before they go to a team in Canada. Tommy, you want to make a case for a city in Saskatchewan? <laughs> Get a team in Regina. Uh, <laughs> you know what? I would, I would love to say yeah, and no, but I don't think there's any chance. There's not enough people. The dollar, like we just talked about, the taxes. I don't think there's there's zero. Hey, look, I like Quebec City just as much as the next person. I love playing there in the American League against the Citadels, and I know it's the Northeast and, and all that, but I don't think there's a chance. I think if and when the NHL does or if they move the team or something, I think the next stop would be Houston, Texas. I don't think, unfortunately, I don't think anywhere in Canada, anywhere near uh, getting it. You know, we've talked about this. It's come up in a lot of conversations here in the last several episodes here at the Clearing the Crease podcast powered by Bodog.net and how, um, you know, I do wonder about, you know, the impact of Canada going forward where, you know, look, taxes are taxes, right? And, you know, we look in Canada and we can, Say what we want about paying taxes, but that fixes our roads, our health care system, which we allow for everybody to be able to go to the hospital. Um, you know, mm-hmm. is it perfect with the higher taxes? No, but there's also there's benefits to to <laughs> paying those. Uh, and we could debate in terms of how where it all goes in the mon- money, but it is starting to become a hindrance for players that have the option to kind of choose or where they want to go. And as and as the league becomes, you know. When we were kids, guys, you know, more than 80% of the league was, were Canadian born players, right? We're kind of at the point now it's maybe half the league is, is Canadian. And that, that number is only going to continue to, to, to shrink as more and more growth continues in the United States, more growth in Europe as well. So I, I just, I'm curious to see what the long-term future will be for some of these Canadian teams that, you know, there were a lot of measures that were put in place in the early 2000s to try to keep, you know, the smaller markets propped up when the dollar was really going in the wrong direction. But right now it's, it, it's not a fun time to be a Canadian team trying to stay competitive in the national hockey league. It's difficult. And, and fortunately there is a cap. So you're never going to run out of issues, right? Like you're, you're always going to have that base. You'll always have a team that's, that's very strong. The, the franchise value of the Ottawa senators is a billion dollars. So that, that can tell you where the owners are at financially, but the other thing is too, and and we talked about it with Alex Klorn, is social media has changed all this, right? Yeah. The Canadian guys can, you don't have to, you can be popular anywhere. You can be popular in Anaheim. You can play in the AIC playing for Tampa Bay and Anaheim. Used to be, you had to be a Toronto Maple Leaf or a Montreal Canadian or Vancouver Canuck to get the free car and the free Blackberry. Now you get it everywhere. And now you can do it social media wise and you can do your golf tournaments in, in Toronto and come from out of town and, and you're still very relevant. So I think social media has also played a big part in allowing guys to be popular, be famous in, in smaller market areas that aren't in Canada, that aren't hockey obsessed. hundred percent. Well, thanks Audrey for uh, Audrey from uh, that buzzkill way to bring us the the show. <laughs> There's Sorry, no Audrey. hope for any small Canadian team. Sorry to no, I, I'm, I'm kidding, but congrats on the bright side. You've got yourself a free Jersey courtesy of our friends. Uh, Bodog. Okay. We're going to uh, wind this one up and we will be back. Uh, same bad time, same bad channel. In just a couple weeks here with a new edition, but don't forget everybody. It's summertime. That means the ice action in Bodog is hotter than ever. The new season just around the corner. So get your early action in. pick your cup winner for next season. Bodog.net has you covered with futures action. That'll keep you in the game and in game shape during these dog days of summer. In the meantime, Bodog also has you covered for all Major League Baseball action. You can find props, game lines, futures. Make those home run picks. Score big with Bodog. Check out the at Bodog CA Twitter page for details on how you can get up to 400 bucks free cash to play with right now. 
That'll do it for this week's edition of the Clearing the Crease podcast. For Andrew Raycroft, he's Mike Commodore. I'm James Sabalski. Our producer is Stu Stone. Uh, Stu Stone. There you go. All right. Getting a little carried away there. I got to get out of here. Peace out, everybody. See you next time.